<laughs> Order. <laughs> Order, uh, I call this meeting to order. This is a standing committee on community services and I am Melissa Sheehy Richard, the MLA for Hans West and chair of this committee. Today we will hear present presenters regarding the community improvement grants. Just remind everybody to please turn off your cell phones or put them on silent. And in case of an emergency, please use the Granville Street exit and walk up to Grand Parade. Also, as a special note, uh, they are going to be doing blasting today, so we might be entertained with three long horns and then a big bang. So if you need to pause during your questioning or answering, uh, that, that's fair, or we can just uh, go through. So it should be an experience. Pardon? Yeah. The Big Bang Theory, yes. <laughs> uh, I will now ask the committee members to introduce themselves for the record by stating their name and constituency, beginning with MLA White. John White, MLA for Glace Bay and Dominion. Nice to meet you. Uh, good morning, Larry Harrison, MLA for Colchester, <laughs> Muscadaba Valley. Good morning, Danielle Barcos, MLA for Chester St. Margaret's. Good morning and welcome, Tom Taggart, MLA for Colchester North. <laughs> Good morning, everyone. Susie Hansen, MLA for Halifax Needham. Good morning, folks. Kendra Coombs, the MLA for Cape Breton Center, Whitney Pier. Good morning, Laura Lee Nickel, MLA, Cole Harbor, Dartmouth. And I'm Ben Jessam. I represent Hammonds Plains, Lucasville. Good morning, everyone. And for the purposes of Ledge TV, we are also joined by Chief Legislative Counsel uh, Gordon Hebb and Le Legislative Committee Kirk Tamer Nasebi. And the topic today is community services, uh, community improvement grants. And I want to welcome again the witnesses and ask them if they would like to introduce themselves, beginning with Deputy Minister Houston. Hi, my name is oh, uh, Hi, my name is Justin Houston. I'm the Deputy Minister responsible for communities, culture, tourism, and heritage, as well as the Office of Old New Affairs. And Mr. Shore. Hi, my name is Chris Shore, and I'm the Executive Director of the Culture and Heritage Development Division of the Department of uh, Communities, Culture, Tourism, and Heritage. And Mr. Greenlaw. Thank you. My name is Bill Greenlaw. I'm the Executive <laughs> Director for Community Sport and Recreation. And at this point, I would welcome uh, Deputy Minister Houston to give his opening remarks. Great. Uh, good morning, and thank you for inviting us here today. It's nice to be back uh, with you all again. I think I was here uh, a couple months ago, maybe, on treaty education. Uh, well, we look forward to discussing our community improvement grant program, and I'll use my opening time to share an overview, and then uh, Chris and Bill will provide some more details of the programming. The mandate of communities, culture, tourism, and heritage is fundamentally about supporting Nova Scotia's people and communities. A significant uh, portion of our budget, about uh, $91 million this year, is invested directly into communities through grants and funding programs. We have over 77 grants and contributions that fall under five types of programs, annual investments, application-based, proposal-based, strategic investments, uh, and awards <laughs> and recognitions. We support everything from sport and recreation to artists and musicians to African Nova Scotian and Mi'kmaq community organizations to French and Gaelic language development to active living projects that help build healthier communities. In the past two years, film and tourism have joined the department and we invest millions to help create local creators and operators grow these important sectors of our economy. For example, we're investing $15 million in the new five-year Nova Scotia Content Creator Fund to support local creators. We're working to support a healthy and balanced industry where international productions find a home here while local creators also have the resources they need to grow and thrive. The department is collaborating with Screen Nova Scotia and the tourism industry of Nova Scotia to look at how to leverage the work of the film industry to promote film tourism. We want to understand what is possible and how film tourism has contributed to the visitor experience. The investments in community infrastructure have social, environmental, and economic benefits. These investments support the construction of hard assets like trails, rinks, legions, and community centers, but also provide less tangible social assets that are linked to providing core services to, to communities. For example, and, and Bill will speak to this further uh, later, but we've done a lot of work with our sport and recreation partners on anti-racism and safe sport initiatives so that those activities are more inclusive and welcoming for all Nova Scotians. 
We've also targeted our grants and adjusted on the fly where we've needed to over the past last couple of challenging years. I joined the department in 2019 and then a few months later, COVID hit. The department's played a critical role in government's response to the pandemic. Impacts have been particularly challenging as, as folks who around this table would know for the arts, culture, museums, sport, recreation, and tourism sectors. Staff were in constant conversations with these sector partners to create new funding programs and supports to help them navigate and recover from the pandemic and that work is ongoing. Of course, Hurricane Fiona last September caused significant damage throughout Nova Scotia, particularly in the northern areas of the province and on Cape Breton Island. The department responded by opening some of our museum and library sites for Nova Scotia's in the days following Fiona. Our three largest museums, the Museum of Natural History in Halifax, the Maritime Museum of the Atlantic here as well, and the Museum of Industry in Stellarton all opened their doors for free. They offered spaces for people to charge devices and warm up. Smaller sites opened when they were able to, including Highland Village uh, in Iona, Fundy Geological Museum in Parsboro, and many local libraries did the same. Libraries that had power or weren't, weren't dealing with their own damage also helped Nova Scotians access the online form for Fiona program supports. Uh, speaking of which, following Fiona, the province within two weeks, I think, the province introduced a new community generator program to help community groups purchase and install generators at community centers so the centers are able to serve as gathering spaces during power outages. There was such a significant response to the call for applications that the province increased this year the funding from the initial announced $2 million to $5.8 million, helping 180 community organizations. Uh, the call for 2023-24 um, is now open and will close on February 14th. So if there's questions about that, we can help assist. Uh, as you can see, our department's well positioned to support communities. It's something that we, we take very seriously. We make sure all constituency offices are informed of, of grant programs, when applications are open, and when the deadline is to submit them. We work hard to be nimble and adaptive in how we meet the needs of communities that we serve, which is the heart of what we do. We are constantly balancing consistency and accountability with being responsive to varying community needs. Over the past two years, we've undertaken an extensive program improvement project and we're in the final phase of it now. This is something that I highlighted in, with the Public Accounts Committee. We've worked to improve consistency and documentation, but we're also focused on equity, diversity, and inclusion. Staff have reached out to people who have received funding from our grant programs, but also to those that have been unsuccessful in the past or have never applied to us before. We're identifying where the barriers may be. And one thing that's clear, especially in communities that have been historically underserved by government, is that we can't copy and paste our processes or take a one-size-fits-all approach. That's not equitable. So I'm pleased to say that we've made major progress. We've updated our guidelines, applications, and reporting to ensure that applicants link their projects to the program's objectives. And we've developed tools and hosted training sessions to ensure we're embedding risk assessment in all our programs. And we're making sure our processes are accessible and meet the needs of the communities we serve. I'm going to leave it at that for now, and I'm going to hand it over first to Chris Shore and then Bill Greenlaw to say a few words. <clears throat> Mr. Shore. Thank you very much. Thank you. Um, my name is Chris Shore. As I said, I'm the Executive Director of the Culture and Heritage Development Division. Uh, so Culture and Heritage Development Division supports the development of Nova Scotia's arts, culture, heritage, festivals, and major events through uh, investment programs to enhance cultural, economic, and social growth. So my division is divided into four units, uh, one of which includes the Special Places Protection Unit, which has responsibility for archaeology in the province. Now, I know that is not the focus of today's committee, but I just thought I would mention it because there's a significant number of very interesting files and interesting interactions with all government departments, including the Mi'kmaq of Nova Scotia. So the other three units in my division are Events Nova Scotia, Culture and Heritage Development Unit, and Arts Nova Scotia. Events Nova Scotia works with communities and event organizers to attract and develop major uh, sporting, cultural, and entertainment events across the province. So we use the Nova Scotia event strategy as a guide, and the Events Nova Scotia team works to position Nova Scotia as a leader in event hosting and works to ensure that we deliver events at a very high level. So a recent example of that would be uh, the World Junior Hockey um, tournament that recently took place in Halifax and Moncton. Uh, another example would be the Devour uh, Food Film Festival, which takes place every fall in Annapolis Valley. 
So we recently announced a $2.2 million investment in a community hub uh, that will help the Annapolis Valley continue to grow as an international culinary and cultural tourism destination. <coughs> so renovations to the Devour Studios in Wolfville will allow to have a permanent home in Wolfville, allow the festival to have a permanent home there, and provide space for arts events, local food retailer, and, and local food retailers. The other unit that we have is the Culture and Heritage Development Unit, which manages programs that support creative industry sectors and the culture and heritage sectors. So the creative industries, film and television, music, publishing, craft, visual art and performing arts, supports the commercial capacity of arts and culture businesses and organizations. The program also supports export and export development projects aimed at increasing the market reach of Nova Scotia creative enterprises. This past year, my division uh, assumed responsibility for the Nova Scotia Film and Television Production Incentive Fund. This is a $25 million fund that supports film and television production in Nova Scotia. In 22-23, we also uh, invested an extra $16.4 million um, um, and increased our, the cap for any one film and television project uh, to $10 million, up from $4 million. We, uh, we made these changes to keep up with demand uh, of industry needs as film production has really taken off in Nova Scotia in the past three years. We've seen a significant increase in the number of projects that we've seen. The unit also provides operating funding to 70 cultural organizations and 68 community museums. Community-owned museums employ over 250 people, mostly in rural communities in Nova Scotia. The unit funds also our heritage property programs and is responsible for the registration of heritage properties uh, in the province. Arts Nova Scotia is the provincial funding agency that supports uh, professional artists and arts organizations, arts educational programs, and several awards and prizes. Arts Nova Scotia has a unique governance model that maximizes its efficiency. It's governed by an 11-member board of directors. Uh, the, um, the unit operates at arm's length in terms of funding decisions, but the staff of Arts Nova Scotia are, are provincial public servants. This keeps the administrative costs uh, at a minimum while maintaining the international standard of arm's length funding model using peer assessment committees for assessing and evaluating grants. So Arts Nova Scotia has eight funding programs and administers seven awards annually. So that's a general overview of my division and the programs that it offers uh, in support of arts, culture, and heritage. And I'd like to pass it over to my colleague, Bill Greenlaw. Mr. Greenlaw. Thanks. As always, <clears throat> thank you and good morning. Um, I'm just going to dive right into it. So I believe that the best way to describe the, um, the division that I'm the executive director of of is that we work in community for community, supporting them to become more vibrant, welcoming, and engaging places for current and future residents. Well, the title identifies sport and recreation, and these are important sectors of which you all, I believe, have an understanding of. CSR also promotes uh, community sport and recreation, because I'll use CSR throughout it, also promotes and supports physical activity through a number of initiatives, including our Active Communities Fund, and we also support the Mi'kmaq and Municipal Physical Activity Leader Program through that. There's over uh, 50 uh, people that we support across the province in that program. Uh, we all know and understand that sport is important to Nova Scotians, and we engage these sectors primarily through provincial sport and recreation organizations. We also work closely with our colleagues at Sport Canada, the Public Health Agency of Canada, and other provinces and territories and gov uh, territorial governments to ensure quality and safe opportunities for all to be active. <clears throat> Through the physical activity file, we engage local communities and recreation units within municipalities to support physical activity goals outlined in the Let's Get Moving Action Plan. CSR supports all forms of recreation, including those that may not be active recreation. And what I mean by that, examples would be like photography, art, music type programs. And we also support the community halls of which these uh, activities are engaged by supporting um, in infrastructure investments uh, such as heat pumps, et cetera, windows to uh, that through our community development grants and our, our uh, recreation development grants. Uh, but we are so much more to communities than sport, recreation, and physical activity. 
We have six regional offices. Many of you know our regional managers, and I know that they're quite familiar with your constituency assistance. Um, and their focus is to connect communities with investment possibilities that our department has to offer. CSR takes a whole of community approach where we spend time listening to community members to make sure that they can leverage our investments to maximize their potential. We support local infrastructure projects, including new ball field dugouts, for example, community gardens, community halls, skate parks, splash pads, local trails, and active transportation pathways. These are just a few examples of the reach of my division. CSR has a lot of tools to assist community with what I will call the wraparound supports, like supporting local community ki kitchens to provide meals to those in need for a meal or a Meals and Wheels type programs or organizations, to, help, to helping repair or replace furnaces with a heat pump or windows in a community space, or helping communities become more accessible through our accessibility grants. The staff in the department and in the CSR division often help new Nova Scotians uh, or organizations by spending time with them to make sure that they understand our processes and help them with their applications. It is part of our culture to become more human-centric and client-focused. In fact, we've helped emerging organizations with the basics of just getting set up, from how to secure a not-for-profit status uh, with the province, to board governance, uh, anything related to that that you can think of, we, we've assisted uh, local organizations with. And if you can think of it, we probably have helped. Um, the Rink Revitalization and Community Generator Fund are two important grant programs that my team has stood up and administered in the past 18 months. Since 2021, we've supported 55 rinks to make much needed repairs and 180 organizations to purchase and install generators so community members are able to gather in a space during power outages. We also make investments that address community accessibility needs for, for not-for-profits and the business community as well. The Community Accessibility Program and the Business Accessibility Program support accessibility-related capital improvements in accordance with Nova Scotia's commitment to equal opportunity and improved access to community facilities. Improvements can be for clients and customers, for employees, or both. They range from automatic door openers to ramps to planning grants to assistive technology for employees. We also have grants that are available for communities to help address food security for the most vulnerable members. These investments are really needed and deeply appreciated by volunteer organizations that support community members. We have heard how energized, and, uh, how energized volunteers feel about their community when they know they're assisting people and families who need help in having a healthy and warm meal. CSR has two grant programs that are available for communities to apply to. The Food Strategic Initiative Grant supports, far, supports the Farmer's Market of the Nova Scotia Initiative, or some of you may know it, the Nourishing Coupon Program. It, all, it provides low-income households with a dignified way to shop at member markets for free with a week, using a weekly credit. Last year, uh, this program helped 600 households in communities across the province, uh, which is quite impressive. And the second grant is the Community Food Accessibility and Literacy Program provides investments to help educate community members on food preparation, healthy eating, and shopping within a budget. I wish my sons would know that. <laughs> <laughs> Through this grant, we also have investment, so we also invest in community gardens. Yeah, Thank you. True. It is true. My, I, 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 it's a conflict of interest for my children to go to the program, but I wish they would. Uh, <laughs> Uh, uh, we, do, we do great work at CCTH and, and in my division. I'm so very proud of our dedicated problem-solving team, and I know that you've witnessed firsthand our approach with working with your offices and with the citizens in your communities, uh, and we really do try to think outside the box and, and, and help the best that we can. Uh, we are constantly listening to community to make our programs and funding models work for them. Uh, we are very conscious of the accountability frameworks that government requires of us to ensure that our investments are getting both a qualitative and a quantitative return on public dollars that we invest on behalf of the government. I look forward to your questions. Thank you. Thank you very much. And at this point, we will uh, go into the questioning of the witness by members from the committee. And I just want to remind everybody to wait until their names are called and their mic turns red for Ledge TV purposes. And we will start with the 20-minute round with the Liberal Caucus. And 
uh, MLA Nickel. Thank you, Madam Chair. And thank you for your presentation. It's um, all encompassing and very large you know, to absorb. It's a, it's a lot of money from all of you. And, you know, the accountability piece where I always, that's the hat I always wear. So I'm always looking at that through that lens. Um, I know you, Bill, you mentioned about you're trying to adopt as many funding models, you know, to address, um, you know, the, the inflationary pressures that we are experiencing now. And you mentioned the, um, the couponing program, but our caucus was calling for an inflation indexing across multiple government programs as a mechanism to combat that and to help Nova Scotians with the soaring cost of living. So I'd like to ask about in the context of CCTH, you know, as a number of grant programs it has to administer, I just wondered how are the program budgets being reviewed for maximum effectiveness to, to address that need? Deputy Minister Houston. Uh, thank you for the thank you for the question. Uh, certainly, affordability and the inflationary costs has been a big issue for a lot of the groups that we work with. So, we work with them on a on a daily, weekly basis, uh, understanding what some of their pressures might be, and looking at ways that we can adapt our programs to to meet them. Or if we have funding available, slippage that wasn't used in a certain program, we look at ways that we can assist. So we we part of our budget process, we put forward our pressures every year, and then then you know it goes to Treasury Policy Board and for, for government make decisions on our budget. So we're always, our staff work very closely with, with all the groups. And so we have a pretty real time uh, sense of where folks are at. And certainly we're feeling some pressure um, for, the, for the issues that you raised. Um, but I would say that you know, based on the last two years, um, I'm very confident in our ability to meet those needs uh, and be adaptive on a, on a regular basis. So it's something that we, we have practice doing, but it is certainly a, a growing issue. Emily Nickel. Thank you. So the 2022 follow-up report from the Auditor General tells us that only 58% of its recommendations from its 2018 audit on grant programs have been completed. That's almost half of its recommendations that haven't been implemented over that five-year period. Those include important recommendations like establishing performance indicators for grant programs, developing appropriate monitoring to ensure each stage of the process is followed correctly. So does the government still plan to meet these recommendations? And if so, on what timeline? Deputy Minister Houston. Yes, thank, thank you for those questions. Uh, and those questions were the line of questioning for public accounts um, a couple months back. So, so uh, yes, we're working to, to finish those. I think of the, the four that were remaining, I think two have been completed and we're on progress by the end of this fiscal to complete the other two. Um, so, sorry, was there, there two? Yeah. So, so um, part, of the, part of the delay, frankly, you know, COVID hit and our focus was focused on how we adapt and change programs. But also when we got into looking at the, the program delivery, we, we, we wanted to focus on so first, just to note that the, the Auditor General found that there was no issues. They just thought that it could be strengthened by, by greater accountability, which we totally agree with. But as we started to dig in the programs, we didn't want to just add another layer of accountability without also looking at uh, accessibility and EDI, frankly, which was not a lens that we had on a lot of the programs when they were built. And there, you can imagine you know, over 77 different programs that have come in it's kind of a bit of a Frankenstein in some ways of all these programs. And were they the most effective and were they meeting communities' needs the best they could? So that's where our program improvement project really got underway was based on the Auditor General's recommendations. And so from that, I think we built a really good process and we have put in place uh, all the recommendations that the Auditor General uh, made and they, the last two I think will be completed at the end of this fiscal. MLA Nickel. Thank you. And with this process, I mean, accountability is on both sides, yours and the, and the applicant. And I just wondered if there was a criteria that's put public out there as to how you score each one and um, also who has the final approval and is that scoring criteria public? Deputy Minister Houston. Sure. I'll start a general response to this, and then I'll, I'll hand it to Chris and Bill for some examples. So because the, the scope or the breadth of the different programs, we have so many, there, there are different, essentially, approaches. Some of those uh, 
programs are application based. And so an example there would be, you know, Chris can speak to some of these, but there would be very clear criteria upon which their applications would be graded. Uh, and then others are proposal based. They just come in and looks like a good proposal. It's something we entertain because it falls along with our program stream. So um, there is a level of accountability. So for example, on most programs, there's a hold back until a final report is is provided, which we can then make sure that the money was spent the way it was, or if it's a physical uh, asset, we can go and check and see, you know, if it's accessibility grant, was it was it completed? Was it built to the standard that was required? So there is that level of accountability, and maybe I'll hand it to first. Chris can give some examples, and then Bill, because I think they give you a sense of the specifics. Mr. Shore. Thank you. Yeah. So there's a, as the deputy mentioned, there's a number of different ways that we evaluate, and accountability. There's kind of like you can look at it in two ways. You can look at it as the accountability as we receive an application, and then there's the accountability piece after something is funded, and we want to make sure that the money that we've given is in fact given for the reason it was. And so the first part is really about having guidelines and um, scoring grids and matrices that are there. And those are all available for all the programs that we have. We have about 44 of the 77 outward facing application based. These are applications with guidelines and this is how you fill it out and it comes into us. And we have th two or we have actually three different ways that we would evaluate that. So if it's an arts based grant, Arts Nova Scotia uses peer assessment. Those are experts that are brought together. They look at those grants, they evaluate, they make a recommendation. We also use staff uh, panels where we have a mixture of external experts and staff. And then we have internal review as well. And every one of them has to meet uh, and be scored. Um, according to what the particular grant does. Um, in, in the case of infrastructure, it's the same thing. So when an infrastructure grant comes in, it's reviewed by staff. There's a terms and conditions document that's developed. It has milestones. It has things that have to be met. There are meetings. There are inspections, all of those pieces. So in terms of the outward, you know, the last part of accountability, um, all of that, there are final reports that have to come in. There are holdbacks in certain areas that are met, and all of that's checked. So that's all part of that accountability matrix. And Bill, I don't know if there's. Mr. Greenlaw. Yeah, sh uh, sure. I don't really have much to add. I mean, that's pretty much how we do it in, in my, well, in the department, in my division, similar. It's fairly consistent. Um, but uh, the question is, the, the, ultimately, the, min the minister approves the grant, so that we don't fetter the minister's responsibility. So all of the grant programs go to the minister for approval. So uh, whoever the minister of the day is, is the final sign-off on the recommendations, de depending on the, how it was jury. But at the end of the day, it's the, it's the, it's the minister that signs off. And secondly, I just want to talk about, about the uh, measuring success, if you will, or the output. So as I talked about in my opening remarks, <clears throat> there's qualitative and quantitative, right? So the quantitative measures are easy. You get an ROI, how much money did I get back on that, and was it two to one or three to one investment? But our department's really about qualitative as well. So the feeling of sense of belonging to community, and what, how do you measure that? So we're working with, uh, groups like Engage Nova Scotia and the Quality of Life Index to figure out how we get our handle and our wrap around those kind of measures. Uh, but they are equally as important. And uh, about 2018, <clears throat> we had a discussion with the Auditor General Office about qualitative measures and about working with new and emerging uh, um, groups that have been excluded from uh, access to funding or excluded or new, new Canadians, et cetera, and to give us, allow us to give it, gave us the ability to move into the qualitative space to measure that. And I think that's really, if we, if we have a sense about being Nova Scotian and about a sense of being in our community, it's that qualitativeness that makes you feel proud. And it's not that I make $3 on my $1 investment. So I think our department is a bit of, a bit of both. And it's, uh, it's uh, and I just want to make, I, the qualitative measures are equally or more important than the quantitative hard numbers. So I just leave it at that. Emily Nickel. And I, I thank you for that, having had many years experience in grants at the municipal level, it's, <laughs> and where we had an actual grants committee that vetted it, but we don't have that at the provincial level. And that's why the qualitative piece is where, I guess, the wiggle room 
is as well. And so therefore that criteria is determined, as you say, by, by the minister. So good for you to be proud of you know, what you put forward, but sometimes it doesn't land as the way you would recommend. Just wanted to put that out there. And uh, so I'd like to ask a question now about the Community Food Access Fund. And we know that over the past year, we've seen more food insecurity and food bank usage than ever before in our province. Feed Nova Scotia in here recently who were able to update us. And I think that's when Justin, you, you were, I think you were here that day, perhaps. I can't quite recall. Anyway, I'd like to ask about its subscription. How many organizations receive funding through this program in the past year? Are we seeing the enrollment where it should be and could be qualitatively? And how could government improve the fund to make sure we're seeing fewer food deserts and more access points to food from Nova Scotia families? <coughs> Deputy Minister Houston? Or, I don't know, did you or, want to take some bills in your yeah. the world? Uh, Mr. Greenlaw. Sure. Um, so we have, as I said in my opening remarks, we have two uh, grant programs. So uh, the Food uh, Securities Initiative, which I, we like to think of as food in belly, so it's good about feeding people, and then the the Canadian, the Canadian, the, uh, the, fo the food and literacy access program is about gardens and learning. So if you have a community garden or you want to do those education type programs or the budgeting as I referred to in my opening remarks, that would be a CFL type grant. Um, we have found that the greatest success, uh, I mean, we do, we of course support the food banks, et cetera, but as, uh, during um, COVID when we, um, when there was the, the issue of food security was heightened because of people's uh, inability to get food, um, we did an extensive sort of uh, um, look at what was available in community and you know and you shouldn't be surprised, but maybe being in Halifax, we were surprised about how supportive and the mechanisms that are already placed in community. And so what was enlightening from that perspective was that we didn't need to find millions of dollars to support community. They just needed $1,000 to go buy foods or $2,000. Now that is a lot of money to them, but not in the amount of money that you, you know, maybe make the, the headlines, for example. So we were very successful in reaching into local community uh, uh, groups uh, that uh, organize the kitchens and community and, and distribute the food. Um, we initially started off thinking that the Meals and Wheels program would be the, but, but again, like through our own learning, realized that that's not a global universal thing across the province. And so we had to figure out how to maneuver and we've uh, like very, for, like this would be an, uh, an ROI, I don't have this specific, but for our amount of investment in investing in, in local food uh, uh, security issues, uh, the, they leverage that funding in defeating like a, 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 an impressive amount of people locally in community. Um, and so recently, uh, 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 Reserve Minds, the food bank up there, so they uh, they did an excellent job uh, in meeting community needs during Fiona, where people were without power in kitchens, and they fed the community. They ran out of uh, their, their 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 available funding, and we were able to, in the department, find an extra hundred thousand dollars to reinvest in that community, so they continue on supporting people of need in that community. So um, it's I, I mean I. I at that level, I can give you the feedback. I'd have to get dig down and to give you the specific numbers, but it is impressive. And I think the key learning is that, and because I'm the community's file, is that if we look to community, they just need support, and they don't necessarily need a lot of support to activate things in community. And I know you all witnessed that firsthand. So, uh, so I think uh, it is an issue. Um, it's a, an issue that we're addressing. The government has done is uh, through the Department of Agriculture is doing the food strategy, and so we're waiting to see the results of that, and uh, that may solidify our ability to support uh, uh, insecurity, food insecurity needs across the province. Uh, Deputy Minister Houston has a comment. Oops, sorry, thanks. If just a quick follow up on that too, and won't use up too much time. Just want to note that our the application deadline is coming up from March 25th for the Community Food Access and Literacy Program. Uh, so for your constituents or others that are interested, and just an example of of one of the projects that that CCTH has helped play a leadership role in um, in terms of supporting is the mobile food market here in Halifax. So it's a great example of 
community idea, need identified, and then coming together to make something happen. And that, that funding comes through that program that I just mentioned. Emily Nickel with five minutes, 519. Thank you. I was wondering. Mm -hmm. and, and thank you for, because I've been involved in those programs when they were initiated at the ground level. Mm -hmm. And, um, but I wanted to ask specifically, so I, I just decided, I've been wanting very much to go to the Woolfield Farmers Market and decided to go up Friday, stay overnight, mm -hmm. support local, and then that cold snap hit. <laughs> I stayed an extra night, good for, good for Wolfville's economy. But I wanted to ask about the farmer's markets in particular, like some of the vendors that were there um, that showed up, you know, in that storm were there, you know, because that's their economy. And I just wanted to know if there's any available funding streams to help them on an operational cost, because as we, I've always supported local and bought local, but I just wondered how in the future can they get operational support to actually provide food that's in their neighborhood? Yeah. Uh, Mr. Greenlaw. Chair. He's excited. I'm just excited. <laughs> <laughs> Who, who says they're excited to be at committee? Come on. Uh, yeah, community's culture and heritage. Tourism and heritage. Uh, oh, you're, you know my tactic. Thank you. Um, I think, um, I actually, I've gone blank on the question. I was well, I, I'll start. I'll start. Deputy uh, Minister sorry. Houston. Yeah. Uh, so, yeah, we actually, we don't have a specific funding program for farmers markets, but we do, we have worked with a lot over the last, like, since I've been here for three years. So, for example, We've done um, solar panels on, a, on, I think, one or two farmer's markets to help them in terms of cutting their costs and also moving in the direction of, of greening their energy sources. We've provided uh, other funding in terms of whether it be tourism-related, uh, real link into an asset. Like, I go to the, the farmer's market and will fill all the time, too. It's one of my favorite places to go. So the idea of how do you take something that is a community anchor and grow that further to kind of the conversations that, or the, the comments that Bill made. Every community though is a little bit different and everybody has a little different idea of what they need to take it to the next level. So our job is to, to listen, be adaptive and hear what, what folks come to the table with. So that's an example of some of the things we've done with the farmer's markets. Thank you. Uh, Emily Nickel. How much time? Uh, 2.54. I would strongly, you know, look into that. I mean, because they were there in freezing cold, and uh, there was a young person. He just started to get into microgreens, and I supported him mostly because he was just starting off. May not know about grants. A lot of the people there, a lot of people in Nova Scotia, don't know where to apply for money, and so that. And I mean, in part, it's our role, but it's it's all about supporting that young person who's having the microgreens. Mm -hmm. To the, okay, you can continue. <laughs> Deputy Minister Houston. I, I'd just like to touch upon something. Thank you for letting me speak because uh, one of the things that we found with the program improvement process is one thing that we can do better about is helping people understand all that is available for them to apply to, whether it's a, a small farmer that's starting off that might be able to access something into agriculture or to us. But one of the things that we've, so we've developed a tool, an online portal, which we're going to go live with soon. We'll share it with folks when we're ready to go. That's essentially like a, a questionnaire that when people get on, instead of trying to find the exact program they need to apply to, and if they don't go down the right door, maybe they don't access the program, is it's asking a series of questions that will then open doors for them. And at, at basically in every door they eventually will open, there's always an option to call somebody in the department to find out more information. Because what we're finding is that some people, we try to do the best that we can. If, if you call Chris, Chris like, that does, doesn't quite apply, go talk to Bill's team. But we know that some people will just get discouraged because they don't see, doesn't relate to them. Oh, guess nothing's available to me. So to your exact point is we're really trying to make sure that all Nova Scotians realize that there, there is funding out there to support the things that align with government's priorities. Emily Nickel, just under one minute. Okay. It, just quickly, um, I just wanted to ask you if, there, if the Building Vibrant Community Fund still existed. Deputy Minister Houston, or Mr. Greenlaw. Thank you. Um, the Building Vibrant Community uh, Grant Program no longer exists. It was part of the uh, poverty reduction strategy of the previous government, and DCS is, uh, has a, is in process of developing a new plan, and so the, those Building Vibrant Community Grants ended uh, at the beginning of this fiscal year. 
And just an add-on, the department invests in not-for-profit organizations. So, like, so if the if the farm industry or the person that's growing that is a business, generally not an ex a way to access that kind of funding from our department. The, the the exception would be the business accessibility grants, where we fund businesses to become more accessible. But other than that, it's essentially not-for-profit. So I just want to be clear on that. The date of the plan is coming up. Which one? Oh, I'm sorry. So the time for liberal uh, questions has ended. Uh, I just want to ask Deputy Minister Houston, maybe when the portal goes online, you could share it with the, the committee. It's excellent to hear. Uh, we will now move on to the NDP caucus, beginning with Emily Coombs. Thank you. And for, uh, first, thanks for being here. And on behalf, of the reserve, on behalf of Reserve Minds, thank you for that funding. They work extremely hard and are constantly at our office. And um, so, but I do have a question with regards to the grant review. Um, can you say which programs have, um, have switched some segments of the program from a grant model um, to one that would be more of an operating with funding over several years? Deputy Minister Houston. Yeah, thank you. So we do have, there are stream of funding which is operating. Uh, and Chris can speak to that a little bit more around some of the arts and culture organizations. And then we have other programs which are grant-based. Uh, so they don't, they don't necessarily switch over, uh, but we do have that stream of funding which would go towards certain organizations uh, that will qualify, and then there's, they can apply for grant program funding over and above that. Uh, and there's some organizations which don't currently receive operating. And we look to try to support them through project funding where available so that they can continue to, to, to provide those services. Emily Coombs. I'm just wondering, with regards to the operating funding, um, do you know what the dollar amount that is? Mr. Shore? Um, so we have, uh, in terms of arts and culture, mm -hmm. um, so we have about four streams of operating support that's provided. Um, so four different programs, more or less, that are there. Um, I'm trying to think of the exact, I have to do some quick math. It, we can, you can get back to me. Yeah, yes. so Deputy, I was just say, we'll provide you with the Deputy Minister Houston. We can provide you with those exact numbers uh, and provide that. We have that broken down, just trying to find this in the binder right now, but yeah. Emily Coombs. Thank you. Um, on the same stream that uh, my colleague, um, Ms. Nichols, was talking about um, regarding inflation and funding, um, it was mentioned in opening statements that, um, that the department's being responsive to financially to the film industry and their needs. And so with the costs, with inflation, costs uh, for organizations have rised dramatically. And much of that is has grown by 50% and continues to grow. This inflation continues to grow. I'm just wondering, because um, I don't think it's fair to ask them to, to be able to continue with the same funding that's been frozen for a very long time now. And so I'm just wondering, with operating funding to many community organizations, with that, with that, with those been frozen for years, what can we expect from the upcoming budget? What is your ask to the department? regarding um, unfreezing those funds. Deputy Minister Houston. Uh, th thanks for raising that question and the issue. It's something that your colleagues have, have raised as well. Uh, it is an ongoing challenge around operating. Uh, funding, as you're aware, has not, uh, for operating, has not moved in, in over a decade. Uh, recognizing that, however, is that, like I said earlier, is that we are, we do work within our, our budget to be adaptive and flexible, and, and we understand, certainly, uh, from organizations, we meet with them on a regular basis, and they tell us some of the challenges that comes with uh, going for project funding when, you know, they're having a, a challenge just keeping the operating. We, we understand that. Um, we are able to kind of keep things moving in year to year, but it is something that we're certainly putting forward in the in the, the budget. We're still working on that in terms of, but we've heard from the groups of what they need, and they've been very clear with that, and they've met with the minister on a, on a regular basis. So we have a feel we have a good understanding of where that is. And of course, though, as you mentioned, though that that changes. It seems that you know 
it goes as, as inflationary pressures and other pressures uh, are real. So it's moving in that direction. But I would just, I do want to emphasize that while not perfect, we are, we have been working closely with those organizations to help them navigate. Yeah. Just, Mr. Shore. Thank you. <laughs> Just to further what, what the deputy said, so I'll give you an example of that. Uh, and and I, I, knew, I know we've been working very, really, really hard at the whole operating piece, and I know that the uh, deputy has heard that from community, I think, from the day uh, that you arrived in the department. But we have, for instance, uh, a culture innovation fund. Uh, and within that fund, we have a community engagement stream. So that is open to organizations to kind of help them, particularly arts and culture organizations, uh, and others as well, but develop new audiences. So while we're trying uh, our best to advance uh, you know, the request around operating, we're also recognizing that trying to give those organizations the tools to develop other st revenue streams is really important. So that culture innovation stream is targeted exactly at that. It's trying to allow organizations to find new ways to attract audiences and give them invest and, and invest in that, in their um, infrastructure to do that. And Malay Coombs. You mentioned with that, um, you were mentioning rinks and issues like that, and those are one; those are one of those organizations that really struggle to keep to, for their operational funding. Um, I have uh, three of them that service my ridings, and that is their biggest. That's one of their biggest issues is trying to keep those rinks open. So a generator is great, but it doesn't help them. And I think we need to keep in mind many of these are really small small little organizations mm -hmm. um, that are volunteer based for the most part. And so I just, I think we, I, and I, and I am really hoping that, you know, through your advocacy and your work, um, and I know Bill has always been a very much of an advocate for um, community culture and heritage. I know his name quite a bit just from CPRM Council. That this is something that I think really does need to be advocated with, with the mm -hmm. minister. So I hope that that advocation, that advocacy is happening. Mm -hmm. Okay, and so with regard, I want to move on for a minute and ask about um, more parts about the budget. And so the government government asks community members to reach out through their MLAs, offices to provide input. Mm -hmm. And I, I, I want to share, and so with that, there was one that I was kind of surprised by, and I'm just wondering if maybe any of you can shed light on it. Um, they were talking about that when the, government, when the government is reviewing uh, grant eligi eligibility requirements to allow more integration into collaborative work between arts, culture, organizations, and education institutions. And what I heard was that the or yes. Oh, my fudge. <laughs> the, you hear the whistle before. The organizations... <laughs> The organizations can't get funding uh, for programming that takes place during the school hours. Can you clarify clarify that? If, if, if that is Deputy true? Minister Houston? That's not an issue I'm aware of. Um, and Chris might be able to speak to it, but we'll, we'll f <laughs> if he can't answer it right now, we'll, fall, we'll find out and get back to you on that issue. Mr. Shore. Thank you. Um, I'm kind of guessing a little bit, but um, about the organization that you're speaking about. So we do have a program. Um, offered through Arts Nova Scotia, which is an artist in the school program. <clears throat> there are three, there are four different organizations that deliver it. We provide funding as does the Department of Education. It's specifically around engaging students outside of the regular school hour. So that's the, that's the, the point of that program, these artists in the school programs. One is called the Paints Program, which is about visual artists. One is called Perform, which is about performing artists. Uh, there's a Writers in the Schools Program, and then there are two programs delivered through the Art Gallery of Nova Scotia. But they are specifically geared at after hour engagement of students with uh, arts practice. So that's if that might be what you're referring to. So those are, are the, the point of those programs is actually engaging students outside of the curriculum hours. Emily Coombs. Yeah, uh, thank you. I, I, I want to explore that a little bit because in many schools, arts is being almost diminished out of them. Like, um, I once, when I, went to, when I went to high school, there was a drama program. Now, there's no, there's barely any drama programs. Um, there's, 
I, I heard of someone say, I, I went to Beck, and Beck had a great drama program, and now it's gone. Um, and there's several other of these types of programs, arts, what have you, that are slowly leaving the schools um, for STEM and not STEAM. Um, uh, STEM is with um, the math and sciences, and STEAM includes the arts. Uh, <laughs> which I, I've been learning over the past few years. And so I'm just wondering, um, with that, wouldn't it, and wouldn't it be better at some point to have some of these programs also during school hours, considering we lose a lot of kids. Many of them are, some of them are bus students. They can't stay after school. Transportation is very difficult. And so we lose a lot of the kids that we want to get having these after school programs because of <clears throat> transportation issues or other issues within that. So can you just, is there a chance of getting some of these programs during school hours? Mr. Shore. So you're making a really, really good point there and I'm a big believer in STEAM, including arts in that, in that piece. Um, one of the things to remember is that things that are like activity that happens during school hours is really about the Department of Education, early childhood development. It's about curriculum. It's about professional teachers delivering that curriculum that's, that's been approved. Um, the programs that we have are not about, so we don't have teachers, we have teachers present, but they're not actually uh, delivering the content. We often, so the writers in the schools program, as an example, would bring a professional writer into the school there's a teacher present, and then they would give workshops, writing workshops to people afterwards. So it's our way, because we don't have jurisdiction over the curriculum or how that's designed necessarily, we would, will feed in where we can around it and provide um, students with the ability to actually act, uh, interact with professionals to get to, so that they have a sense of what that is, whether it's writing or visual arts or performing arts. So that's kind of where we feed into it. Deputy Minister Houston. But just to take a step back, I think it's a very valid point and question, and it's something that we can follow up with our colleagues at uh, Education about. Um, you know, the creative economy is is a major driver here in Nova Scotia. Uh, it's it, it isn't. You know, people think of it as, as well the arts. Well, no, it is. It is one of our our major industries here, and we need to support that next generation. So, uh, very good point. I'll, I'll follow up with my colleagues around that. Emily Coombs with 813. Thank you, and that's, and that's what I ask of the department, is to follow up, because as you said, with a teacher present, or teachers are to provide programming, but if you don't have that teacher, that programming doesn't happen. And so that's why it's so important, right? And, the, and I, I think w departments breaking down silos is the most important thing that we can have here. And, mm -hmm. I, and you, you said something with, re and so, I think that I think those are very important, and I'm glad to know that you're a believer in STEAM because I'm also a believer in it. Um, and you also, it was also mentioned that it's one of our biggest industries. It's bigger than fisheries. You know, it's it's one of our. It is the actually, I, it's probably one of the biggest uh, with our fisheries and uh, and a few others combined. It's one of our biggest. And in Cape Breton, it's highly important because when we lost our two big industries, mm -hmm. it was our cultural sector that kept us alive. Um, Bet McDonald always said, when coal left and seal left, the arts community kept Cape Breton alive and going. So it's very important to us. Um, and on that note, um, la uh, last year, I believe, Mr. Houston, uh, you confirmed that the department is working with, the, with uh, municipal affairs to determine how might CBRM be able to administer um, an arts grants program, um, and which would include changes to the MGA. Uh, could you provide an update on that? Deputy Minister Houston. Uh, I will pass it over to Chris Shore, who is okay. intimately involved with this issue. <laughs> Mr. Shore. Thank you very much. Um, yes, yeah, so we have been working with our colleagues at the uh, Department of Municipal Affairs and Housing. Uh, changes to that, so that's a specific request that came from CBRM. Um, and it, in order for them to provide that you know, direct support to artists or businesses requires a change to the Municipal Governance Act. And we reached out to our, uh, our colleagues uh, at Municipal Affairs and Housing, and they are, in fact, in the, in the process of uh, reviewing the MGA. Um, they're doing that in stages. Um, as we understand it, the, that component of the MGA is part of the economic development 
uh, consultation that's going to be happening later this year. So what will happen there is when they have that, they'll go out and consult with all municipalities, and they're bringing that specific at, at our request, but I'm not sure, you know, it's not only because of our request, but we've asked them to, act, to bring that question as part of the consultation when they go out and consult with all the 55 municipalities in the province. Um, so that the responsibility for that piece really rests with them, but it's something that we flagged with them and we've asked them, please make it part of your consultations. Emily Coombs. Thank you for that because um, the MGA has been being reviewed since I was, I, I was a councillor in 2016, it's been being reviewed for um, almost over almost a decade now. So six, when, when you said that, and I, I made a little noise, it was because it's been almost a decade and it's still and being it's reviewed. Phases. And it's in <laughs> yeah. fa now it's in phases. So it, it's getting a little long in the tooth and it's gonna be need to re-reviewed. Re, re and so I'm just one, uh, so I'm glad to know that you have been flagging this and my hope is that we will see something come the spring session with that. I'm gonna fling it over to my colleague, Susie Hansen. Ms. Hansen, Emily Hansen. How much time? Uh, 4.42. Perfect. Thank you, Ms. Chair. Um, you may have seen that part of the cuts are being considered through HRM's budget process include supports for arts and cultural organizations, and I know we've all heard this. If these cuts come to fruition, will the province step in and fill that gap? And I guess this would be to the Deputy Minister. Deputy Minister Houston? Uh, certainly, I, I mean, in principle, we'll, we'll work with any organization that comes forward and look at ways that we can find solutions. Uh, that said, it's, it's, I don't really have the context, so couldn't say. In some cases, we may already be providing funding, and so it may not be possible, or we may need to uh, look at ways that we can support an increase. But uh, it's certainly, you know, that we, when we typically fund a project or fund an organization, we're looking at leveraging with other levels of government. So one of the things that we look at is, you know, where is the municipality coming in on it? Where is, or is the federal government if it's relevant coming in on it. Um, and so part of that equation is like, we will have conversations with our municipal counterparts uh, and federal counterparts to, to understand where their level of investment is. And, and uh, I think, you know, I think my sense is that and I'm not privy to any of the conversations they're having, but I think they're just kind of figuring out what's the range of things to consider. And further to MLA Coombs' comments, I think there's a, I, I hope and I, I believe there's a good understanding of the value of those programs, not just for citizens, but just for, for the overall well-being and economy of the city. MLA Hanson with three minutes. Thank you. So to touch on the recommendations that my colleague spoke about, um, um, a recommendation is that the government double operating support for cultural and arts organizations that index them to inflation. I'm wondering, will the department be doing any of this when they talk about moving forward with support? Deputy Minister Houston. I always not sure where to look. Uh, <laughs> yeah, uh, <laughs> it feels like, you know, when you're interviewing somebody, you're like trying not to look at the camera the whole time. Um, <laughs> So yeah, I mean, we're, we're definitely aware of those operating pressures and it's something, um, we're not looking at indexing, that's not something that we, we do across our programs, but we are looking at ways that we can increase their operating support. MLA Hanson. Thank you. Um, another recommendation is that the gov government commits to a minimum of three million over three years for specific initiatives to be determined and adjudicated by Arts Nova Scotia and or the Department of Communities, Culture, Tourism and Heritage for new programs directly related to equity, diversity and inclusion in the arts. Will the department be doing this? Deputy Minister Houston. <laughs> uh, yes, certainly around the committee, we are looking at ways of strengthening that. Uh, I'm not sure the exact amount. We're still in those those phases, but we are considering uh, where we can dedicate additional funds to support the arts, particularly in the area of EDI. MLA Hanson. And another one is that the government work with Arts Nova Scotia and the Department of Communities, Culture, Tourism, and Heritage to ensure organizations which were worst affected and are still feeling the effects of COVID-19, shutdowns and slow recovery, have stabilization funds in the next two years. Will the department be doing this? Deputy Minister Houston with a minute and a half. Uh, yes, the uh, short answer is that we continue to do so and we will continue uh, as we hear from groups. I, I can think of a couple just over the last year like, Things have not rebounded to the way that they were, and some, some sectors and some organizations are feeling it more than others just by the nature of, of the work that they do and the communities they serve. So we'll, we'll continue to be responsive to that. Emily Hansen. 
And this next one is, can you give me an update on the new art gallery and when it will be built? Deputy Minister Houston. How much time do I have left? <laughs> yeah, 53 yeah. seconds. Uh, there, there, are, there are no set dates in terms of when, but the, the work continues uh, within the board and ag &S. They continue to explore options, and we're waiting to see when the time will be right, but don't have anything concrete at this point. Very good. You have 35 seconds. So I will say that it will be interesting to hear how this works out since there is no board for um, the AGNS. He can respond. The minister Deputy Minister Houston. Uh, there, there is a board. They have, they have quorum now. Um, and so they will be proceeding uh, with as, as, a, as a separate entity because now they're a crown, a separate crown. Okay, we will move on to the Progressive Conservative Caucus, and we'll begin with MLA White. Well, thank you, Chair. You guys are a wealth of knowledge. I feel like we could have brought three of you in independently because your departments are so big. <laughs> but my, my first question is about the community generator program, which a lot of attention was brought to after Hurricane Fiona, but ironically enough, one year from today, we, were at, we had noise storm in Glace Bay, and I was on, at a senior complex for 13 hours trying to help folks there. And at one point, we were looking at transferring those folks to Sydney. There are three senior complexes on one power line. I don't know how they designed that, but that's what they did. So you have a lot of folks without power in a hurry. And I realized that I could see Glace Bay Fire Department, like literally five minutes down the road, but we were looking at transferring to Sydney to 20, 25 minute drive. So these, this program is, is extremely valuable. Uh, I'm happy to say that Glace Bay Fire Department did get a generator and so did Dominion Fire Department and UNIA, the three in my constituency. I'm very happy to see that because there was really nowhere to go. There's nowhere. So in 2022, we created the program and obviously for great reasons, for, for gathering with uh, people that are from your community and whatever else that you know. So can you tell us a little bit about how many applicants you received under that program? And, and we kind of know why, but maybe you can elaborate a little bit as to why you agreed or decided to increase the funding for it as well. Yeah, just can't take them home. That's right. <laughs> De Deputy Minister Houston? <laughs> they missed it. Oh, okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, uh, yeah. Um, no, thank you. Thank you for the question. Um, I'll, I will let Bill speak to some of the details of it, but just at a high level, um, you know, I, having dealt over the weekend with a burst pipe in my own home and, and, and losing power shortly, uh, it's the worst possible time that those things can happen and people need a place, a safe, warm place, whether it's following a, a hurricane or it's uh, during an ice storm. And so when the program was, was stood up, we weren't quite sure what the response was going to be, frankly, but we knew that it was going to be significant. We thought $2 million would be significant, at least for the first call, and we received close to $6 million in, in request. And these range from everything from a small community hall to a fire station, so they, they range in scale, and, and we... Uh, Bill's team will speak to a little bit it was really about listening to what was coming in and figuring out ways to be adaptive as well as terms of how to flow the dollars uh, and the accountability piece. So I'll let Bill speak to it a little bit in terms of the actual numbers. Mr. Greenlaw. Thank you. Um, so we had 180 applications in the first round and and we were <clears throat> with the additional support this year of the $4 million were able, everybody that applied uh, that was, will receive, will re, has received funding. Um, so that's pretty good news. And uh, the second call closes on February 14th. So we expect uh, that to be, well, a uh, good uptake on that. That's $2 million back to the normal base. Um, we've had inquiries from uh, not-for-profit uh, health clinics that are associated, like that, uh, uh, the drop-in clinics or where their whole... Uh, medications are held or, or that need to be refrigerated. So I think that was from, uh, where was it from? It was, anyway, it was, uh, I can't remember which, it was, uh, it was, liber uh, it was um, um, MLA Maslin's constituents, or was it yours too? Okay. Oh, yeah. So the, uh, we, we're going to, I mean, basically to, in consultation with the minister and the deputy is, you know, the intent is to have not-for-profit facilities with generators. 
right? Uh, that serve the public. So that's kind of the basis as we're evolving through this. So we will eventually get to everybody. Uh, and so that the the clinics, those type of clinics weren't necessarily in our radar, but certainly they would they would be eligible for funding because that's the intent of the program. Um, and you know the 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 uh, the, uh, the requests for investments range anywhere from like five thousand to the max of fifty thousand dollars. And who knew that some generators to install, et cetera, were one hundred and fifty thousand dollars, right? Yeah. So it's not like the little portable one that I I, I have yet to buy for my host because I'm still waiting to figure out which which kind of wattage I need for my host, but. Uh, uh, and uh, I, I too, like Justin, I um, I'm just did, I have a son with special needs, and he he doesn't understand when the power's out. Mm -hmm. And so, if the internet's not working, and the, his iPad isn't working, and et cetera, it's not a happy place in my house during that time. So uh, if we have neighbors that lend us a generator, so we can, you know, the internet will work if you have power for it. So uh, I certainly, uh, you know, uh, understand the whole spectrum of needs to losing, you know, your Months worth of groceries in your freezer, uh, so uh, I, I'm, I think it's a great program, and uh, I was really pleased that the, when we communicated to the government what the what the demand was, that the, the government was uh, was able to provide us an additional four million dollars mm -hmm. to meet that demand, mm -hmm. that urgent demand, and particularly now with the power outages again, there's another round of immediacy of needs uh, for generators. Emily White. Uh, earlier, you mentioned qualitative assessment. Uh, just in relation to generators, I know the UNIA is a gathering place for the community, right. so it's important to charge your phone, have a cup of tea or whatever. But when you talk about Glace Bay Fire Department, you're talking about charging TMR radios for the paramedics, for the police officers. You're talking about uh, filling air bottles if there's a structure fire time. It's, it's just so, such a broad perspective that I'm glad that you really, you mentioned earlier, and it was really, my ears picked up when you said it because it's so important. There, there are different needs, so absolutely awesome. But my next question is totally different, and it's really, uh, uh, the uh, World Juniors was obviously such a great success here. I mean, just absolutely amazing. You, you couldn't get into a restaurant unless you had a book well ahead. So it was great. The economic engine is just amazing. So I'm curious about uh, how communities can access support from CCTH to develop events in their own community. Uh, in particular, uh, through the department, you supported uh, the Hawk Stream Field in Dominion, which is uh, possibly going to be the only field in North America that had a Rick Hansen Gold Seal Standard Award. So the Special Olympics are on the horizon for that. And that would be such a shot in the arm to that community. So I'm just wondering how uh, communities can provide, uh, apply for funding on that. All right, Mr. Greenlaw. So uh, I won't talk about World Juniors. So we, we help produce the athletes that go to World Juniors. We don't do the events side, so I'll hand that to Chris. So the success of our athletes, our Canadian athletes, is through the sports system. We can all take credit for that, but uh, Chris can take credit for the World Juniors and the greatness of the event here. Uh, uh, but we do, but, but, what, uh, but, but more pointed to the, 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 the field of dreams, um, that leveraged an investment. So we came on, I mean, we, as a deputy said, we particularly like to see if the feds are on board or not-for-profit and we come in and match those dollars, which we did in that aspect. And a lot of the uh, recreational infrastructure that is essentially world-class now and, and around the province uh, are good investments to attract those sorts of venues uh, and those events to, to uh, your communities. And so, um, and everybody wants a Rick Hansen accessible field now. So it's, 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 it's that, uh, oh, uh, how did John get that? I want to know how I get that in my writing. So it's kind of how these, uh, so lots of demand. So what? I didn't say it was political. I, thought, I just said, or... Anyway, so it's, an, it's certainly, it's, uh, it's, it's not political. So uh, I'll hand it over to Chris. Mr. Shore. So I think, you know, it, it's interesting, the interplay between the infrastructure piece and the actual event piece. So as Bill mentioned, you know, whether it's tracks or whether it's the Benet Canoe Club that has upgrades that allow an event like Canoe 22 to be highly, highly successful. Um, in, in, in Dartmouth is those things go hand in hand. But the Events Nova Scotia team, which is part of my division, is really uh, the team that's responsible using the Nova Scotia event strategy to support communities across the province uh, develop their capacity to host events. Different size 
communities uh, have different kind of capabilities, and that events team, so has uh, webinars, uh, they have information sessions, they talk to different communities about what kind of things they want to, they want to support. We have a festival and events program, which is for um, smaller, smaller events uh, right across the province when they're looking at trying to build capacity to uh, running their uh, event in their community, they can access funding there. And when they have a, a slightly larger event, they come to our uh, major hosted events program, which is uh, an investment into uh, larger events when those communities are ready to do so. Um, when we have a large uh, we have opportunities for very big, uh, oppor you know, very big events like the World Juniors. We, of course, make special requests in through the department and to Treasury Board because we've identified that this is a world-class event uh, and it has a great opportunity for everybody in Nova Scotia. World Juniors is a perfect example of that. Uh, we were able to move quickly on that one because those were originally slated to happen um, in Russia and they were cancelled, but we were positioned well because the events team had a good relationship with Hockey Canada and we had worked with them for a long period of time. But those big, big events, uh, North American and Indigenous Games is coming up uh, in July. Uh, absolutely first time it's going to be spectacular. All those kinds of large events come through uh, our team and we support the bid process. We support uh, trying to get them and attract them. Uh, and, and then we support, we provide support right down to a community festival that, that will happen. Uh, the uh, the, the uh, we have examples like I, I can't think of them right off the top, but you know we have uh, lots of examples of great or, or great festivals that happen across the province. Deputy Minister Houston, if I could just add to that to to, to echo or to, to kind of build on something that Chris said is that it, every community is going to have its own desires and its own capacity to, to host different events. So. Um, you know, I, I think of the, the event that happened, was it last summer or the summer before with the, the sailing in, in Lunenburg or Mahone Bay? Yeah, yeah Chester, yeah, Chester St. Margaret. I mean, that's a great example of something that's that kind of, it's perfect for that community. It's the right size fit. Uh, and it's important to remember as well is that sometimes because, you know, Halifax is the capital city or, uh, you know, big events will tend to come to this area. Like I think of NAG, uh, which is coming, the North American Indigenous Games, which will be the biggest sporting event in Atlantic Canada ever held. Uh, the amount of people that are going to come to the province or from the World Juniors that come maybe to Halifax, but because, you know, NAG is happening in July. Well, you know people are going to travel around and they're, they're going to be here. And so part of this event strategy isn't just the actual return on investment for the events. We're working really closely now that tourism is a part of the department to look at how we can build events strategy into tourism strategy as well to look at particularly... Uh, shoulder season events. So something like the World Juniors was amazing because it's happening in the time of year when they're typically tourism isn't up. But if we can look at attracting whether it's a curling competition or it's something on the shoulder seasons in late fall, early spring, that's really where we're looking. And, and we're competing across North America and across the country because everybody's looking at that coming out of COVID. How can we grow and expand tourism, not in the high season, but in those, those areas? So I really encourage for those with communities that have aspirations of doing something, particularly um, that suits your community, but in maybe not in the peak of summer, uh, definitely want to work with our department because we have some opportunities for sure. Emily White. Thank you. Uh, just before I pass on Emily Barkhouse, the community has a, a Rock the Hill event scheduled for the grand opening of the field on July 2nd. So when you talk about community and your quality assessment, you're giving opportunities for them to fend for themselves. And uh, hats off to you. It's a great job. Emily Barkhouse now, please. Great. Emily Barkhouse. Thank you. So you mentioned NAG, and I think it's absolutely fantastic. 16 sports, 47 venues, 756 Indigenous nations from all over in Turtle Island, 5,250. So it's fantastic. But um, uh, I got to ask, uh, can, can you tell us a bit um, of the Mi'kmaq Culture Activities Program and how how it aims to, to support the Mi'kmaq culture? It's a great lead in to that question, I think. So, so ML, no, demo, Deputy Minister Houston. Just to, just to clarify, MLA Barhouse, so this is around the, the broader Mi'kmaq cultural program? That's correct. Okay, That's yeah. Program. Right. Yeah. So, so I can speak, I'll, 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 let, me, let me flag two things there. 
uh, and I'll, I'll talk to them, and Chris can speak more specifically to the, the program, but one of the other things we do that Bill touched upon earlier as well is that we have a Mi'kmaq Physical Activity Leader Program. So this is something that started with the MPOWs being municipal, uh, and so these are folks that are in, is it 11 of the 13 communities, or all 13 communities now? It's 10, 10 of the 13 communities have someone who is a paid staff member that is just responsible for working with their communities around physical activity. So it's working with kids, adults, whether that, so that's an example of something, but it is within the cultural context, and it's, so I can give you an example of Member 2. So Member 2 is a part of their development. You might be familiar, they built a great walking trail with medicinal plants and signage, so it's a part of their tour of the community, so you can do a tourism aspect to it, but it's also this amazing now network of trails that not only the community can use, but the greater Sydney community can use as well, and it ties into other existing trails. And that all came from leadership from the MPALs and the communities and the work that they're doing on the, on the ground. So that's an example, I, I kind of went on a little tangent there, and then we have a specific that Chris can speak to a little bit, a specific Mi'kmaq cultural program, funding program, which is just geared to working with Mi'kmaq communities, artists, organizations. But I want to emphasize that the broader work that we're doing across the department around program improvement is that every single one of those programs is available for Mi'kmaq communities and individuals and art, artists or whatever the criteria is. So part of the work that we do is to make sure that they can access every program that we provide, not just those that are geared towards them. So, and then I'll, Bill, can you speak, I mean, Chris, can you speak a little bit to the? Mr. Shore. Thank you. Yeah, so uh, one of the other advantages that we have is our deputy minister happens to be the deputy minister of the Office of All New Affairs. So we have a kind of built-in um, uh, communication with both with teams. So we work really closely with uh, staff at All New Affairs looking at all ways that we can support uh, Mi'kmaq activities. Specifically, the, the Mi'kmaq Cultural Activities Program is a project based, so these are project funds. Uh, that come to us um, from the community, and and, um, and there are two deadlines uh, a year, um, and we fund all manner of, uh, of projects that come through that are specifically in and around enhancing uh, either forwarding specific initiatives or um, enhancing Mi'kmaq culture. A, a good example, like an example of a recent one that we funded, uh, is all about elder stories and about capturing those elder stories, which is a big component of that of, of Mi'kmaq culture. So going out and funding someone to go from community to community to actually talk to elders, to tape it, to digitize it, and to make it available forever for people to be able to access. Because as we all know, many of those elders are um, going to be passing away, and we want to make sure that the, the communities capture the knowledge that they have uh, and that they want to pass along for younger people. So that would be an example of, of one particular one that comes to the Cultural Activities Program, and there are a number of them. Mr. Greenwell. I just want to highlight that the uh, the MCAP program, as we call it, Mi'kmaq Cultural Activities Program, was developed in partnership with the Mi'kmaq. So the Mi'kmaq, we said, we have a set amount of money. How do you think that we can best use it to leverage, and what does the community want? So we engaged. So this was a creation of the Mi'kmaq, and we administer the program. So they had their input, and that's why it's designed in this way. So I think that's an important you know, demonstrates our how we try to work with community and meet the needs of community. So I just wanted to highlight that. So. Emily Barkus with three minutes. Okay. Um, February is Black History Month. We know that Nova Scotia has uh, many historic African Nova Scotian communities that have enriched our home with um, culture, history, achievements. Um, but we also know that um, they, they have long history of mar marginalization, excuse me, <laughs> what are what is the department doing um, to support underrepresented communities, or can you share a bit of um, the work being done to support the development of uh, African Nova Scotians and their communities? Deputy Minister Houston. Sure. Um, so again, I'll just emphasize at a, at a high level where we work very hard to make all our programs, grants programs, funding programs accessible to all. And a part, big part of our program improvement process was identifying that both Mi'kmaq and African Nova Scotian communities and organizations were underrepresented uh, in the amount of funding that they were received. So we're looking at across the board and looking at ways that we can increase funding for existing organizations as well as encouraging new organizations and entities to, to tap into what we have available. 
Uh, there are specific programs as well that are within specific sectors. I can let Chris, Chris speak to some. I can talk also about the work that we're doing across, speaking of the programs that we work with a lot of partner organizations, say in the sport area around anti-racism and fair play. So there's a number of initiatives that are looking at supporting um, community groups and organizations. I think of things like the, the Black Ice and, and the Learning to Skate programs uh, that are geared specifically towards the African Nova Scotian communities. But I'll let Chris talk a little bit about some other that are geared in the arts world. Mr. Shore, you have a minute and 15 seconds. Okay. Um, so I'm going to give you just a couple of examples. Uh, so w recently, we work also very closely with the Office of African Nova Scotian Affairs, which is in, housed in our department. So we collaborate very closely with them on how on reaching into the community and community needs. So specifically, we've provided an investment this year to the African Heritage Trust, uh, $150,000 to the organization, for them to develop a new opera, um, a strategic plan and operational plan. Um, they're doing fantastic work. Um, additionally, we provided um, funding to the African Nova Scotia Music Association, uh, $144,000, similarly to support their strategic development plan. So they put a plan in place, and we're uh, helping them to uh, op put into action that, which includes hiring a new executive director, uh, new program staff, new programming. Uh, and similar, uh, another $225,000 to the Black Cultural Center to uh, achieve targets that they identified uh, in their strategic, in their 2022 20, to 25 strategic plan. So those are kind of three examples. They're, they're sort of specific examples of how we're providing support into those areas. And, and we have, there's a couple of, um, there's a, uh, a, uh, a program through Arts Nova Scotia that's also specifically geared to um, recognizing black artists. Order. Perfect timing. Uh, we will move back into the second round of questioning, and we have uh, six minutes and 30 per, per caucus, and we'll begin with MLA Jessam in the Liberal Caucus. Thank you, Madam Chair. Through you to uh, the deputy, we, we discussed briefly the, um, I guess, the removal or move away from the Building Vibrant Communities Fund, which was designed to alleviate poverty. Um, given that this is the, the the Community Services Committee, I felt it important to bring back uh, that to the topic of conversation. Um, is it the deputy's uh, impression, that given that there is plans at DCS to come up with some type of plan to replace that, will there be, I guess, a, an accompanying mandate or how will the Department of CCTH support that work? Um, or is it the deputy's understanding that that work will be driven specifically through the Department of Community Services. Deputy Minister Houston. Uh, thanks. Thanks for the question. So, yeah, the DCS is is working on in terms of the poverty reduction strategy and the work that they're doing there. Whatever. Uh, further to MLA Coombs' comment around breaking down silos, the approach that we, we take at CCTH is we're going to work with our partners across departments to serve the communities the best we can. So we have the ability, we have an in-reach into communities, some of the organizations we work with, whether it's around food security, whether it's around after-school programs. So waiting to see what comes of that work, we will be right there working with those communities that we have supported over the last years and new ones that are emerging. MLA Jessam. Thank you. We, we in another um, line of question, we talked about uh, some of the arm's length uh, organizations that, that and, the, and the criteria that's established with respect to applications and grant approvals, but ultimately they come back to the office of the minister. Um, we've seen measures taken to ensure that decision making comes back to the office of the minister vis-a-vis the art gallery, gallery vis-a-vis -vis Perennia, uh, economic development. We've seen intentional mo measures taken by this government to bring decision-making back to the minister's office in several instances since they've, uh, they've taken office. So my question is when, when grants are being approved at that level, is there a, I guess, a written or is there a record of why a grant may or may not have been approved at the ministerial level. Deputy Minister Houston. Uh, 
Uh, yeah, thanks for the question. So, yes, uh, I can give you a sense of the process. I know because I have to sign off on every single one of them every day, and this time of year, it just feels like it's nonstop. Uh, so, thankfully, we've gone, because of COVID, we were pushed to teams, so it's no longer actual physical paper. But essentially, uh, the ADM uh, and myself uh, will approve. So, it comes up. So, basically, let's say, let's say it's a grant program. This is from a $500 grant to a $5 million grant. They follow varying levels, but it's essentially the same processes. A staff recommendation will come forward based on the criteria of a program, which we'll then review to make sure that it makes sense to us. Um, the ADM will review it, approve it, I'll review it, approve it, and then it goes to the minister's office. Uh, at that which time, it's all documented. So if for some reason there's a question that comes down that says, no, I have concerns about this, why didn't X, Y, and Z happen, it will get sent back down. Uh, and for further information and clarification, and then a decision will be made. And so, and so, it's it's rare it's rare that um, you know it doesn't follow a normal process, and something comes out the end of the sausage maker that's it's like, wait, what's that? So we we usually know kind of going into it, uh, and I think what we try to do is work with groups so that there aren't any surprises. So if if you're making an application or community groups make application, we're working with you up front to say look, your information that you're providing just doesn't meet the criteria. Like, here's how we can help you get across the line or help you understand here's why uh, you might not be successful. I think one of the challenges would be is that, you know, we have to do a grading criteria in some of these because we get so many applicants for some programs. And it might be a great program, but in terms of where it's scored relative to others, you know, we might have a million dollars and there might be $3 million that folks are, are looking to apply for. So... In that case, what we'll often do is keep that grid, and if, if slippage or money becomes available at the end of the year, we'll look to tackle some of those projects versus pushing it out to next year. Emily Jessen with a minute 40. Uh, thank you. Perhaps the, the deputy, for the benefit of the committee, could provide some of those scoring, scoring criteria for, uh, for review here. And if, if possible, understanding that it may not come tomorrow, but a list of the programs that have come through the door, those that have been approved and those have, that have been rejected, uh, given that our, our, the province doesn't have a grants approval specific committee similar to what my colleague referenced uh, uh, at the city level. Uh, I think that it would be important uh, for a committee, I, I, I guess that CCTH and grants falls on community services, but. Uh, and, and, and we're happy to scrutinize that if uh, if this is the appropriate committee to do so, given that the government has presented this uh, as a, a topic of consideration for today. Uh, we're happy to to take a peek at that um, at a later date when the when the department, who I know is very busy, um, has the opportunity to present that. Deputy Minister Houston. 27 seconds. Uh, okay, two things quick. Uh, Chris just flagged to say that Arts Nova Scotia is a little bit different. It's a peer-reviewed, so the minister actually doesn't make the decisions. The group makes the decisions on the funding. So that's just good. And I think if we could get further clarification, because we have over close to 80 programs, some of which are focused on, say, art or sport, if there are areas that it might help us prioritize, but we can absolutely get you that, that information. So it's something to think about maybe in your letter back to us to clarify. Order. Thank you. Perfect. Uh, we will move on to the NDP caucus and Ms. Hanson, Emily Hanson. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, so I'm just going to go into the vein of African Heritage Month. And um, I was glad to hear that you're working closely with ANSA and, and, and as well a number of other um, partners to, to help with programming, funding, operation costs, and such. Um, my question is about um, the African Nova Scotian Decade pe for People of African Descent. So DPAD, in particular, um, they had a three-year sustainable funding, um, and they hadn't heard back about whether or not they were going to be funded for a consistent amount of time. Now, we know the work that has been done um, by this particular organization, and I'm curious to know, um, will CCTH, along with ANSA, continue on this process and create more of a sustainable organizational um, funding model so that organizations and groups like this can continue on doing great work within our communities? Deputy Minister Houston. Uh, the short answer to that is yes, we are working to look at uh, ongoing funding for, for that group and others. 
some of the challenges around, uh, and it's not uh, unique to just DPAT or other organizations, is that part of the challenge with our operational funding is that it's been uh, essentially, as, as MLA Combs noted, frozen for a number of years. So new organizations um, that you know you would you would know and you'd be like oh that that one doesn't have core core funding so we're looking at looking at ways that we can create longer term uh, funding opportunities but I know with DPAD the conversation has been ongoing with 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 ANSA around looking at what's the next phase so those conversations are happening right now. Emily Hansen. So I'm glad to hear that you're looking at other options because you did mention, you know, sometimes it doesn't always fit, but you figure out ways to continue with these particular programs because I think that's a value to our communities is being able to have our own voices around the table making those decisions. And um, I'm, I'm really glad to hear that because I will be looking for the budget line um, for some of these funding programs that are specific to our African Nova Scotian communities when we sit in our next sitting. So I just want to say thank you for that. Emily Coombs with five minutes. Thank you. Um, so I want to go on the vein, uh, this concept uh, uh, that um, my colleague was talking about with regards to poverty and cycle breakers and circuit breakers as well. Youth orgs in my community, um, they're struggling with our operating costs. One ED said, I quote, they don't, I don't have enough time, I don't have the same time that I used to have mm -hmm. with the kids because I'm always applying for pots of money and I can, and I'm always trying to have me. I'm always having meetings with um, with other institutions and organizations looking for more money. Mm -hmm. And so, because these organizations are are, are cycle breakers, um, so when you were looking at the receive, um, when you were looking at the reviewing the grant, the the grants process and the, doing that review, did you find that there was a need? There was a need to switch from grant applications to a more core operational funding, considering these are the organizations that are doing the heavy lifting. Mm -hmm. They're the ones that we are continuously relying on mm -hmm. um, as government to provide programming. So, I'm just, so within that review, again, I'll just ask, what, what, did you see a need to switch from the model of grants to a model of Core operational funding. Deputy Minister Houston. The red light. Um, <laughs> uh, no, thank, thanks for the question. It's certainly so. So to, to back up a step is like I think there is a place for for grant funding and there's a place for operational funding and they serve different purposes uh, and need. I think it is something we've heard from all organizations that um, obviously any organization I would like you were like having a, a, a base of operating funding that they don't need to sort of be project based and applying for things. So that's something that we have heard uh, loud and clear and it's something that we're live to and, and working on. Um, I think grant programs should and will always exist because I think it allows uh, us collectively to be nimble and adaptive and say, you know what's really important right now? This, whether it's climate change, whether it's EDI, or this is where kind of the, the, we need the focus. It might be something tomorrow is different that emerges. Accessibility is a great example. Let's put a program in place that we can. So I think it isn't necessarily a matter of switching, but I think to your point, it's around organizations that currently have operating or don't have operating are looking at ways to increase that uh, because it it is a, a can be a time drain for organizations that are looking chasing projects to essentially uh, take their administrative fee off the top. So it is it is a real issue, uh, but I would also say that organizations have been very creative in terms of whether it's shared administrative assistance, they're working across organizations, they're looking at pooling resources, uh, but they've also had to look at things like reducing hours, reducing staff, and, and that, that creates challenges for those organizations that we're, we know are important to the fabric of Nova Scotia. Emily Coombs. Yeah, so on, on that path, as you said, reducing hours, the biggest problem that they have in their core funding is to ensure that they are getting well-trained children, ch child, those that deal with children, children, um, youth, wor youth workers, and as well as youth workers. There's a difference. There's a di um, many youth workers don't often deal with younger children because it's a different Mindset. It's a different, you know. It's a different. Uh, I'd say talent, uh, knowing with my children and uh, and older kids, and so in that vein, we don't want to see reduced hours. We we because 
that means we lose our, the best that we can get for our, for, for our youth and our children. Um, and, and we don't want to see reduced pay. We want to see them better paid so that we can attract the, uh, we can attract them. So, and again, I, I, you mentioned EDI, and I have, a, I have Whitney Pier. That is one of my part of my riding. It is one of the multi, most multicultural areas of the province. It is also has an historic black community. And the ED there is often asked to explain how he does EDI. And his answer is always, come here, we live it. And yet he has trouble finding program money for EDI when it is, it's a lived experience. It is not something that they have to teach. It is something that they do. So I'm just wondering, um, how, how do you judge those types? Like, I mean, we have very white communities who, yes, they need to actually teach EDI, um, and, we, and very communities that they Order. Not also, oh, sorry. Oh, sorry. Uh, the time for the NDB questioning has ended. Uh, we will move on to the Progressive Conservative Caucus with MLA Tom Taggart, uh, six minutes and 30. Thanks, Chair. Uh, so earlier in the uh, in our uh, committee meeting here, uh, Deputy uh, Houston indicated that the creative economy is a large driver in our economy, and uh, MLA Coombs indicated that it was actually bigger than the fisheries. Um, and I guess understanding that the previous government eliminated the film tax credit, um, I just wonder about the, if you could uh, like uh, the $25 million investment that uh, we have made has made a tr tr tremendous difference in Nova Scotia's important film industry. Can you elaborate on how this investment has supported the film industry? Mr. Shore. Mr. Shore. <clears throat> Thank you for your question. So uh, additionally, last year uh, and this year, the, so the, the Nova Scotia Film and Television Incentive Fund is budgeted uh, every year at about $25 million. The last couple of years, we've seen a sharp increase in demand on that on that fund. So in actual fact, last year, uh, we made an investment of $41 million into the film industry. Um, this current year, we're projected at doing approximately the same number. Uh, we've seen the attraction of some very large uh, film projects because of the heightened profile of Nova Scotia. Um, we've been able to increase that cap, as I, meant, I mentioned earlier. We had a cap of projects that were, so when, when a film project comes in for funding, we usually cap, uh, there was a $4 million cap. Uh, we raised that to $10 million because um, of feedback that we'd received, um, not only from the community, but also from um, meetings that we'd had with studios. Um, uh, that they were looking at trying to invest more money in Nova Scotia, and in fact that cap was holding them back a little bit because they wanted to have larger projects uh, that were in place. We've seen a steady increase in the number of projects that are coming through that particular fund. So I think when originally we assumed responsibility oversight for the fund, which was two years ago, the fund came to us for an administration. We had, uh, I think when we, the year before we took it over, we saw approximately 50 to 60 film projects that uh, at the time NSBI was funding. Uh, right now, this year, we're targeting 105 projects. So we're seeing steady increase in, 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 in what's happening there. And one of the advantages, of course, of that fund is that it, it's being used and in, in, in we are investing in projects right across uh, the province. So this is these are things that are taking place not just in Halifax, they're taking place, they're shooting across the province. A great example would be last year, um, Washington Black was a very large Disney uh, production that shot in Lunenburg, it shot in Lewisburg, uh, it shot in Shelburne, uh, it shot here in Halifax. So uh, a rather significant uh, employer uh, and an employer across the board. So what you're seeing is investment in food services, hotel, um, you know, workers. They, they, they use some of our uh, museum sites as locations. So um, gr uh, definitely a growth area. Uh, yeah. And Chester. Thank you. Uh, we will move on to uh, MLA Harrison. Okay. Thank you. I just want to get this one question. <laughs> <laughs> um, just yesterday, I had two communities uh, asking for 
applications for particular grants, okay? Uh, you indicated that we might have a resource to call to get the proper one, the proper application. Uh, yeah, do you have anything in place now or can you, can you help? Because I know the CAs are just constantly trying to struggle, trying to find that one grant that applies. Deputy Minister Houston. So, so yes, depending on the program, like Bill's team would have regional staff that would be located perhaps in your area. The short answer is when we finish here today, you can get Bill's uh, number and he, his team will put you in touch with if it's community related grants. Uh, because absolutely, the, the key for, for folks is, like you said, they, may, they know what they need, they just don't know if there's anything that they can access and tap into. And that's what our team is very good about. And we won't waste people's time. We will tell groups, hey, look, or businesses, look, you're a pay business, you're, you can't apply for this funding. Here's who you should talk to. But if there, if there, is a, if there is a way, we'll make, we'll, we, we work to make it happen. Emily Harrison, 143. <laughs> <laughs> Both, I think, will fall in bills, I think. Oh, thank you. Your department. So, yeah, we can just have a little chat. Afterwards, that would be most helpful. That would be most helpful. Um, yeah, I mean, I'm not going to be able to ask another question because the, the time is there. But I want to thank you folks for all that you do. My goodness, you know, it's, it's all encompassing, really. So, so thank you. Thank you for your time and, and thank you for the work that you do. Okay, well, we will wrap up the round of questioning and uh, ask the witnesses if they do have any closing remarks at this point they'd like to share, uh, beginning with Deputy Minister Houston. Uh, just, just keep it brief. I know you have more to, to do on your agenda. I just want to thank, uh, again, for, for having the opportunity here to speak about what we do. I think someone said it earlier. Uh, we're excited about, like, we, we really like these opportunities because it's an opportunity to highlight the work that we've done and answer important questions from, from members, but also to speak about the work that is planned and, and underway. And I think, again, all of, you know, I can I'll look around the table and I, I've been either contacted by you or your constituency assistants or your offices, uh, the caucus office, like we have a lot of programs. And if there's ever any questions, please don't hesitate to reach out to me directly or to Chris or Bill. And uh, we want to connect your, your constituents and your citizens to the work and the programs that we have underway. Thank you. And just, just the one? Okay. Uh, I thank you very much for being here today. It was a great conversation. Uh, and uh, you are now free to leave as we continue with our committee business. Uh, perhaps we'll take a five minute recess just so everyone can get ready.
going to um, we're going to move into committee business. Uh, the first item on the agenda is the request for clarification uh, to let you know that it has been sent to the Office of Addictions and Mental Health. Uh, that has been sent. We're waiting on a response. Um, item two on committee business is NDP topic for um, access to midwifery and efforts towards reconciliation. Um, Sally Lor Loring, former senior director of Women and Children's Health, pointed out that she has not been in that position for over two years. So. Um, um, I just wanted to uh, ask the members um, if they would like to find a replacement or if they would like to remove them from the list. Okay, Emily Coombs. Thank you. Um, we're, we're happy if we can get the, the new senior director to... Uh, the position no longer the, exists. The no, position no longer exists. Well, the position no longer exists, then we're fine with, the, with those that we have. Okay. So you remove all of the... Yes. Uh, yes, we will remove uh, that witness. Yes. Thank you. Uh, and, top, and item three is a liberal topic, the impact of the cost of living crisis on energy poverty. Um, energy coordinator Brenna Walsh has asked that she have her colleague, energy coordinator Jacob Thompson, take her place. Looking f to see if that's okay. MLA Jessam. Not a problem. Thank you. And I understand there's a, a, a committee business, a new committee business. MLA Jessam has a motion he would like to read. Yeah, uh, just a request for information uh, to the Department of Community Services in light of uh, some of the comments made by our witnesses here today with respect to the dissolution of the Building Vibrant Communities Program. Um, had a mandate at, at the Department uh, of CCTH uh, around alleviation of poverty and that uh, the remarks were made today that the shift has been made to DCS, um, that they were charged with coming up with a new plan to, um, I guess, deal with this move. And I'm wondering, uh, I'm wondering if the minister will respond to, um, to share an update on the work that's being done to address the mandate of the former Building Vibrant Communities Program. Uh, is there any discussion on uh, MLA Jessen's comments from the committee? MLA White. Oh, sorry. Can you let us know exactly what you're asking for? Are you asking for a written response or just can you elaborate a little bit, please? MLA Jessen? So, thank you. Through the chair, uh, my motion is I move that the the committee through the chair write to the minister of the department of community services to update us on the work being done at community services to yeah, replace the work that was being done at cch uh, more specifically at how are they fulfilling the mandate of alleviating poverty uh, through the Building Vibrant Communities Program. Uh, I saw MLA Taggart's hand go up, so we'll have him have a comment. Uh, thanks, Madam Chair. So I, I'm going to be consistent here in that I, I am very unlikely to support any kind of a, mission, uh, uh, of a motion that comes up at the last minute sort of thing, okay? Uh, um, so I'm not going to support it, but I also... Uh, I also believe that uh, you know uh, community services is community services. We uh, just had uh, uh, culture, community culture, whatever. <laughs> uh, you know, and, and uh, so I don't, I don't, I, I, you know, I don't see the. I understand the question, but that was a program that was uh, not been part, as I understand it, not been part of uh, uh, this this government's programs in the past two years. Um, it is, I believe. Uh, I, I don't know, have any knowledge of the program whatsoever, but I think that the, there's been something taking its place, but I'm not sure where it fits here. Um, you know, if, if, if uh, that, that might be a question that maybe they want to have that for one of their topics, I don't know, but I just don't see, uh, I, I'm not going to support it anyway. Thank you very much. MLA Jessam. Yeah, that just for the record, this was a government topic that was submitted for the, for the review of this committee. Um, it, given the, the discussion we had today. This is not meant to be a surprise. This is in response to 
discussion we've had today at the committee where our witnesses remarked that the program around alleviating poverty, which is pretty close to the mandate of this committee, if I'm not mistaken, um, has been abandoned by that department and taken on by the Department of Community Services. So in the spirit of ensuring that the mandate of this program is being fulfilled, specifically the alleviation of poverty, I think it's reasonable that this committee poses a simple request for information to the minister to respond to the question, how is the minister of DCS fulfilling the mandate of the Bi Bi Building Vibrant Communities Program? Emily Coombs. Thank you. Since this is a topic that came up during line of questioning and considering this is the Standing Committee on Community Services, we will be supporting the motion. Thank you. Okay. Um, Emily Barcos, have a comment? Can I call for just a four minute recess um, to talk with my colleagues? Thank you, everyone. Uh, we will have a four minute recess. Okay, order. I call the Committee of Community Services back to order. Uh, we will go to MLA Barcos. Uh, yes, so if I understand correctly, we're asking uh, for a letter, a written response in regards to um, what exactly the department has in plans where this is no longer in process. So I am, we are going to support this. Oh. MLA Taggart has one more comment. <laughs> so. Thank you, uh, Chair. So this is a, a we'll, re, we'll get a response to this letter. It will not be open to debate within this, uh, within this committee at that time. Am I correct in that? Uh, 
I believe when we get correspondence back, there is an opportunity to have discussion on the correspondence once it's received. So uh, we are all in agreement. It, I don't know. Do we need the motion? Oh, MLA Nickel. Thank you, and that's why I was going to ask. So the motion, I wasn't here. Did you? Was the motion put on the floor? And I'm going to be voting on something. I want to hear what the motion is. Because at the end of the day, to simplify it, I asked the question of that particular program. The Mr. Greenwell men mentioned in response that that was defunct, and now there's a new plan. And so we... As a committee that's known as community services, we want to know what community services are going to be doing in response yep. with their new plan. That's that's that's, that's, that's a motion. Yeah. That's Thank you. Yeah. Then I'm in favor. <laughs> Mike. Okay. I think I moved it already. Yeah, he's yeah. moved it. Already. Okay, so we're going to vote on. Everyone's comfortable to vote on the motion that was made by Emily Jessam. Um, could we hear it one more time, Emily Jessam? I want to hear the motion. Thank you. Emily Jessam. So that the, the, the mo I move that the committee, through the chair, write to the Minister of Community Services to request a written response on how the mandate of the Building Vibrant Communities Program, uh, charged with the allevi alleviation of poverty, is being addressed by the Department of Community Services. Within their new plan. Within their new plan. Okay, so everyone in favor of the motion indicate by saying aye. aye. Anyone opposed indicate with nay. Motion is carried. I believe if there's nothing else uh, to be brought up for committee business, that brings us to the end of the meeting. I just wanted to note that the next committee date is March the 7th, 2023. Um, the topic is the impact of the cost of living crises on energy poverty. And as discussed earlier in committee business, the witnesses are still to be determined, but uh, should be cleared up in time for the March 7th meeting date. Um, so I would like to call the meeting adjourned.